Hi, welcome back to our class. Today, we are going to open a new chapter that is on the atomic structure. The concept of atom was first proposed by Democritus in the 5th century BC. He gave the name of the smallest component of matter, atomus, which means unbreakable, to describe the smallest component of matter. This concept of atom remained for centuries until a chemist, scientist, and teacher by the name of John Dalton came to formalize the concept of atom. John Dalton proposed the Dalton's atomic theory. According to John Dalton, that matter is composed of tiny particles called atoms, and these atoms are divisible. Actually, in the first set of his theory, he said that atoms are indivisible, but as he made further experiments and observations, he was able to prove that atom is not indivisible. Why? Because there are still subatomic particles. Another Dalton's atomic theory is that all atoms of the same elements are not identical. Why? It is because of the presence of isotopes. Another Dalton's atomic theory is that when atoms of one element react with atoms of another element, they do so as individual units, and they react in ratio of whole numbers as stated by the law of definite proportion. A given chemical compound always contains the same element in exactly the same proportion by mass. Another Dalton's atomic theory is that a chemical reaction involves a rearrangement of atoms, but there is no change in mass, as stated by the law of conservation of mass. We have already learned in the previous chapters that the law of conservation of mass states that matter is neither created nor destroyed. This atomic theory of Dalton led to the creation of the law of multiple proportion. The law of multiple proportion states that if two elements form more than one compound between them, the mass of one element combined with a fixed mass of the second element is in the ratio of small integers. To describe further an atom, it is stated that the atom is a very, very small particle and that its diameter is 100 millionth of a centimeter. About the mass of an atom, it is said that it's very difficult to determine its mass even if the instrument to be used is so sensitive. However, Masses of individual atoms can be determined by measuring a large number of these atoms. The mass of an atom is comparable to 18 million billion billion of atoms of hydrogen to form one ounce of hydrogen. Now, inside the atom, there are subatomic particles. At the centermost of the atom, there lies the nucleus. In the nucleus, there are the protons and the neutrons which are found. These protons are the positively charged particles, while the neutron is chargeless. And outside the nucleus are the electrons. And these electrons are 
negatively charged particles. And if you try to recall, we have already discussed partly that these electrons are the particles responsible for a chemical reaction. Another important thing to take note about the atom is that it has an atomic number. This atomic number is actually its relative atomic mass. What do we mean by relative atomic mass? The atom has also a mass number. And this mass number is actually the sum of the number of protons and the number of neutrons in the nucleus. So an element can be represented by a symbol like this. There are also relationships to take note about the number of protons, number of electrons, and the atomic number of an atom. The number of protons and the number of electrons are the same. Thus, with this number of electrons, which are the negatively charged particles, is equal to the number of protons, which are the positively charged particles, make the atom to be neutral because the number of positive charged particles is equal to the number of negatively charged particles. Another important relationship to take note is that the atomic mass or the mass number is equal to the sum of the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. For example, if an element has 10 protons and 12 neutrons, so its atomic mass or mass number is 10 plus 12 equals 22. Going back to the Dalton's second atomic theory, in which he said that all atoms of the same element are not identical. Why so? It is because of the presence of isotopes. What is then an isotope? An isotope is an atom having the same atomic number but different atomic mass. The weighted average atomic mass of a naturally occurring isotope of an element is called the atomic weight. The atomic weight of an element is usually a decimal rather than a whole number. Now, how do we calculate the atomic weight of an element? The atomic weight of an element can be calculated based on the isotopes of the element. The formula to be used in calculating the atomic weight is that atomic weight equals the sum of the products between the atomic mass unit of the isotope times its percent abundance. So for example, if we have three isotopes occurring in an element, therefore our formula will be atomic weight is equal to the atomic mass unit times the percent abundance of isotope 1 plus the atomic mass unit times the percent abundance of isotope 2 plus the atomic mass unit times the percent abundance of isotope 3 and so on and so forth if you have more isotopes of the element. Let's have an example. Suppose we are asked to get the atomic weight of carbon. Carbon has two isotopes. One, carbon-12, and carbon-13. Now, carbon-12 has an atomic mass unit of 12, and its percent abundance is 98.89%, while carbon-13 has an atomic mass unit of 13.0034, and its percent abundance is 1.11%. So, if we get the atomic weight of carbon, we have to multiply the atomic mass unit of the isotope 1, which is 12, by 98.89%, 
plus the atomic mass unit of carbon-13, which is 13.0034, then multiply it by 1.11%. So, getting the sum of these products, so we will get the atomic weight of carbon to be 12.01 atomic mass units. Now, let's go to the structure of the atoms. At the center most of the atom is found the nucleus. And in the nucleus, as I have said a while ago, is composed of the protons and the neutrons. The protons are the positively charged particles, while the neutrons are chargeless. And outside this nucleus are the electrons. And these electrons are negatively charged particles. These electrons are occupying the what we call energy levels. An energy level represents a volume of electron cloud. The number of electrons occupying each energy level can be calculated using the formula number of electrons equals 2n squared, where n represents the energy level where the electrons occupy. So, in the first energy level, n equals 1. So, the number of electrons occupying the first energy level is defined by the formula 2n squared. So, substituting 1 to n in the formula, so you have only 2 electrons in the first energy level. Going to the second energy level, if n equals 2, so the number of electrons would be 8 because n squared is 2 squared equals 4, so 4 times 2 equals 8. In the third energy level, the number of electrons will be 18, because n squared is 3 squared equals 9, times 2 equals 18, and so on and so forth. Now, each energy level has sub-levels. For the first energy level, the sublevel is S, while in the second energy level, the sublevels are the S and the P. In the third energy level, the sublevels are S, P, and D. In the fourth energy level, the sublevels are the S, P, D, and F. Now, its sublevel has an orbital. For the S sublevel, the orbital is only S. While the P sublevel has three orbitals. We have the PX, PY, and the PZ. The D sublevel has five orbitals. We have D1, D2, D3, D4, and D5. And the F sublevel has seven orbitals. We have F1, F2, F3, F4, F5, F6, and F7. Each orbital can contain only two electrons and no more than that. Now, how do we fill up these orbitals with electrons? In filling up these orbitals with electrons, we have to follow now, what we call Hund's rule. Hund's rule states that in filling up the orbitals with electrons, it should be done singly first before pairing comes. For example, if you have the atom sodium, sodium has 11 electrons, so that if you fill up the energy levels with these electrons, or if you fill up the orbitals with these electrons, two electrons will go to the 1s orbital, two electrons will go to the 2s orbital, then two electrons will go to the 2px orbital, then two electrons will go to the 2py orbital, then two electrons will occupy the 2px orbital and there is one electron 
that will fill up the 3s orbital. So the farthest electron of sodium occupies the third energy level, particularly the s orbital. Now, in filling up also the orbitals with electrons, we are going to follow the electronic or we are going to follow the electron mnemonic. This is a chart that guides us in filling up the orbitals with electrons. Suppose we are asked to write the electronic configuration of the element calcium. We know that calcium has an atomic number of 20. So it follows that the number of electrons is also 20. So how far can the electrons fill up the energy levels? For calcium, since there are 20 electrons, so our electronic configuration would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, then 4s2. Taking note that in 2p6, there are actually two electrons per orbital. Two in the 2px, two in the 2py, and two electrons in the 2pz. Likewise, in the 3p orbitals, there are two electrons in the 2px, two electrons in the 2py, and two electrons in the 2pz. So the electrons of calcium can reach the fourth energy level in filling up with the electrons. Talking back about the orbitals, they have specific shape. For the s orbital, the shape is spherical. So when we talk about the spherical, it is rounded. For the p orbital, the shape is like a dumbbell. Now this p orbital has a px, a py, and a pz. If we talk about the px orbital, the dumbbells lie along the x-axis. For the py orbital, the dumbbell lies on the y-axis. And for the pz orbital, the dumbbell lies on the z-axis. For the d orbital, the shape is described to be a four-lobed electron cloud. So when we say four-lobed electron cloud, there are two major lobes and two minor lobes. So two major lobes may be located along the x-axis and two minor lobes may be located along the y-axis. Or you may have two major lobes along the y-axis and two minor lobes are located on the z-axis. And for the f orbital, the shape is described to be a complex shape. There are those having six lobes and there are those having eight lobes. That means if there are eight lobes, so there are four major lobes and four minor lobes. If there are only six lobes, so there are three major lobes and three minor lobes. Please add a comment on this YouTube channel to check whether you have watched this video. That would be all for today. This is your teacher, Professor Nisitas Ruiz of Holy Name University.